Let's now come before the Lord in prayer and ask for a blessing over this service. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we can come together and and worship you as your people. We thank you, Father, for your love and for your grace that you have not left us alone, but that you have spoken to us after we have after we had fallen into sin, after we had rejected you, that you love us so much that you gave your Son, and that you work in us by your Spirit, drawing us to you powerfully, powerfully changing our our wills, our desires, moving us to look for you, to long for you, and to be comforted in Christ. We also thank you for this worship service, that we can be together to be confirmed in the gospel, the gospel of our salvation, our deliverance from sin, from death. And so we pray that you would bless us this afternoon as we open your word, as we open your word, and also as we confess to the truth of your word, as we confess the gospel as church. Bless us as we have our catechism lesson this afternoon. May we learn, may we grow, may we be instructed in the gospel of grace. And may it lead to a a growth in faith, but also in our walk of life before you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So this afternoon, in our catechism teaching, our catechism preaching that we do typically in the afternoon, we are looking at Lord's Day 5 in our Heidelberg Catechism, and we're coming to a new section. The Heidelberg Catechism is divided uh, into 52 Lord's Days, and the first section is dealing with just understanding our sin and misery, and the second section is looking at our deliverance, and so we're now beginning to look at our deliverance from our sin and misery, and there's two passages that I'd like to read with you, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, and the first is from Nahum, Nahum, one, we're going to read name one, verses one through eight. And if you're looking in your Bibles, it's Micah, it's in between Micah and Habakkuk. So Nahum, chapter one, verses one through eight. This is God's word. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Alkosh. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and storm. And clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. Earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Thus far in Nahum. And so then we will, we will turn to the New Testament and we'll read from The book of Hebrews, Hebrews 2, verses 10 through 18. So Hebrews 2, beginning at verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and, the one, the, and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell 
of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is God's Word. And the text for the sermon this afternoon is the Word of God, as we have summarized it and confessed it as church in the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 5. And if you'd like to read along with that, you can find that on page 521 of your books of praise. So as was noted earlier, we're now beginning to, we're going into uh, the second part of the Heidelberg Catechism, looking at our deliverance. So when we think about what we need to know in order to live and die in the joy of the comfort of belonging to Jesus Christ, we first need to know our sin and misery, and then secondly, we need to understand, we need to know our deliverance. And so, Lord's Day 5, this is our confession. Question, since according to God's righteous judgment, we deserve temporal and eternal punishment, How can we escape this punishment and be again received into favor? Answer, God demands that his justice be satisfied. Therefore, we must make full payment, either by ourselves or through another. Question, can we ourselves make this payment? Answer, certainly not. On the contrary, we daily increase our debt. Question, Can any mere creature pay for us? Answer, no. In the first place, God will not punish another creature for the sin which man has committed. Furthermore, no mere creature can sustain the burden of God's eternal wrath against sin and deliver others from it. Question, what kind of mediator and deliverer must we seek? Answer, one who is a true and righteous man and yet more powerful than all creatures, that is, one who is at the same time true God. Thus far, our confession. Brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, how shall we escape? That is the question. How shall we be delivered? It's a question that we're faced with in Lord's Day 5. There is punishment for sin, and we are sinners. There is punishment for enemies of God, and we are enemies of God. This is what sin has made us. That's the story of the world. That's how we know where we are when we read God's Word. We're far from home. In Nahum 1, which we read a few moments ago, we saw how God treats those who are His enemies. That the Lord is good, but that those who are His enemies, those who are evil, He will pursue them and He will destroy them. He is just. He hates evil. Evil, oppression, sin, all of it, it will be found and it will be made right. And we're sinners. And by rights, that means that God will find us. And we will receive what is due us. Now, as we looked at at our sin and misery in Lord's Days 2, 3, and 4, we saw that God is just. God is merciful, God is loving, but He's also just. 
we saw the depths of our sin. We saw what we had done and that there's no way of escape in terms of ignoring God's justice. No way of escape in thinking that he wouldn't be fair, that he, wouldn't, that he would be somehow blind to what we've done, that he would deny his faithfulness. That there's no way of escape in terms of that. There must be, if there is a way of escape, it comes from somewhere else. And so what our confession does is it basically says, since all this is true, since we deserve punishment both now and eternally, how, sh- how can we escape this punishment and be again received into favor? The question is important. You know, oftentimes we focus on the answer for the hybrid catechism questions, but look at the question. The question is asked very carefully, and it's a good question. You can tell something about somebody by the questions they ask, and you can tell something about our confession by the questions it asks. You know, at first glance, it seems to be just asking about escape, about self-preservation. How do we escape punishment? What do we need to do? How do we get away from this? We know that God's just, that He'll punish sins, for our rejection of Him. It's a punishment that's both a natural consequence of rejecting God, but also an act of judgment that comes out of God's righteous character, His justice and His love. We know that punishment is there and that it has to be there because of God. His, and we would be consumed by that judgment and we wish to escape it. But it's not just self-preservation. We, we must see that this desire to escape punishment comes with the second part of the question and be again received into favor. If it was just escape, well, then we would follow Adam and Eve as they ran trembling and naked from him out of the garden. That's the way of escape. Get away from God. How do we escape God? We just want to get away from Him. That's that's all we want. But that's not what we're asking. We're asking how do we be received again into favor? What's the way back to God's loving embrace? That's what we're looking for. And our confession asks, how is that possible? How can that happen? We're looking for peace, for reconciliation, two opposing parties being brought back together in peace, and we want to know how to get there. And so that's what we're going to look at this afternoon. We're going to learn a little more about that. And something to keep in mind as we look at at this Lord's Day, if you have your Heidelberg Catechism in front of you, Lord's Days 5 and 6 are actually, really belong together. And if you, we're going to look at just Lord's Day 5, so I'm going to go against what I'm going to tell you right now, but Lord's Day 5, Lord's Day 5 begins with the question that we just looked at. And then it ends, 19, question answer 19, from where do you know this? What you have in Lord's Days 5 and 6 is sort of a a working out of how deliverance happens. It's leading to Christ, and it kind of works it out step by step, very logically. And so what we have is this looking at the way back to God's embrace, but doing it very methodically. And so we're going to look at the first part, at really the payment that's required and then the payment maker. And and what we do is is we're going to see that the Lord Jesus is actually not mentioned in this, in this, this Lord's Day. He will be mentioned in the next one. But we're leading, we're being led to that as we learn. So the answer begins then about as far as the way back to God's embrace is that payment is required. Now, on the one hand, that's good news, that you did something, and perhaps, you know, you know kids, you might have this, you, you do something wrong, and you feel like it's all lost, and then you find out, well, there is a way I can, I can do something about this. Something can be done. 
and you can make payment, and it might be difficult for you, but there is a way. And so on the one hand, there's, there's gospel. Don't worry, we can fix that. I remember as a child, I, I broke a window in my uncle and aunt's house. I, I threw a baseball with a... I probably shouldn't tell you what I did. So, but I, I threw a baseball, and it went through the window of the garage in my uncle and aunt's house. I was so worried what they were going to do. And then I found out we can fix it. But then I found out, I was about eight years old, and it was seven, I still remember, it was seven dollars, which is a lot of money back then. But there was good news, it could be fixed. The bad news is I had to deliver papers for like a month to pay for it. So on the one hand, there's good news that the payment can be made But the challenge is the payment. What is the payment that's required? And what, like, what's the nature and substance of the payment? Is it something that you can pay with money? Is it something that you need to do, like a quest? Is it about life being weighed in the scales, good and bad? that you do good things and you make up the payment? What's the way back to God's loving embrace? And so we need to understand the debt. The debt is sin. Sin has created this impassable chasm between us and God. There's one lone song, my living hope, our living hope, You know, how great the chasm that stood between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. Sin has created this this deep and wide opening in the ground, this, this chasm that we cannot cross. It stands between us and God. We're here and God's way on the other side. There's no way to get to Him. It's made us enemies of God. Romans 5 verse 10, Colossians 1 21, Paul teach it, we were enemies of God, alienated from Him, separated from Him. That's what sin did. And the payment must address that chasm, that, that debt, that hostility, that separation. Somehow that needs to be crossed. You know, think of somebody who hurt you deeply. Perhaps they did something to you that that altered your life, changed your life, brought a world of hurt and pain into your life. And that hurt created this deep chasm between you and that person. And in our fallen nature, it, this question is probably difficult to answer, but is there anything that they could do that would heal that? Heal it in such a way as though it never happened. We looked at this last week with the cup, the fearful cup in the hands of the faithful son. That in that cup that Jesus drank, the cup he he even prayed to God that it might pass him by, in that cup, God made a way for that chasm to be traversed. All our sin, all our shame, all the just punishment to satisfy God's wrath against sin, His justice, Jesus would drink it. And by Him doing that, the chasm would be crossed. We in our fallen nature, and just the nature of this world, it's difficult to imagine I imagine for many of you that you could actually even have a way to do that. That when you think of people who have harmed you, have hurt you, done things to people you love, and that you could imagine that there would be something that they could do that would actually make it as though that thing never happened. In fact, that you were perfectly 
at peace with them. The challenge is that here in this fallen world, there are times where there are sins, that there are things that happen where they will never be fully dealt with till the new heaven and the new earth. We're called to forgive, but at the same time we know that even though we have somebody that had done something horrible to us or to someone we love and we can say we forgive you, at the same time it's so hard to look at them without knowing what they did. What's impossible for us to do fully and we're called to, to want to do it here in this life. But what, it's, it's something that's so difficult for us to do. And due to our brokenness and what sin has even done to us, we're, we're, we're never fully able to do it. But what we can even barely imagine, God has done. He has done the impossible. He has found a way for payment to be made where sin would be covered. And it's full satisfaction of His justice. We read Nahum 1, and it's pretty, when the Lord comes for Nineveh, when He exercises His judgment against them, it's intense. And He will have that justice satisfied. So when we talk about the payment required, it's God's irresistible, ear, unstoppable justice and His wrath. That's the payment that's required. Justice must be done. Sin must be paid for. There is a punishment for it. God's wrath against sin. Eternal Not just in this life, but eternal. Do you understand that? That We're not just talking about, hey, you did something wrong, and so you get five years for it. Or maybe ten years. Or if it's really bad, it's like, you know, maybe like 300 years. It's in this life, temporal and eternal. Wrath against, or sin against God requires eternal punishment. So, that's good news, but that's a big debt. And so, it's great. We can say, we, good, payment can be made. But then when we hear the payment, we go, how can we ever pay that? So the question is really, there's three things that we look at then as we look at the way back to God's embrace, the required payment maker. Who can make the payment? So the first question that's obvious is, can we do it? What do I need to do? Let me know. In fact, every other religion in the world answers the question this way. They, they, there is this sense, if you look at world religions, for the senior catechism class, we're, we're looking at that, we started last week, we're looking at it again. When you look at all these different religions, Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism, even Islam and Judaism, there is this sense, especially with Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and, and Taoism, where you have this idea of there being things the way they're supposed to be and, and, and balance and, and, and good and evil and things being weighed. Religion is always about you doing something, making payment, being a good person, contributing to balance in the universe, being at peace with the universe. But when we look at Scripture, when we look at God's Word, can we make that payment? You know, in a sense, we're qualified. We're, we're sinners. We're the ones that did. We're the guilty party. You know, in Ezekiel 18, verse 4, the Lord says, you know, the soul who sins, the one who sins is the one who will die. And we're the ones who sin. So sin came into the world by man, man are sinners. 
And so we need to pay our debt off. But there's a problem. We only increase our debt. You know, Psalm 130, the psalmist there is, is looking at, at what, what sin has done, looking at himself, looking at the Lord. And he says there, Psalm 130, verse, Psalm 130, verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? In Romans 3, 10 through 12, Paul says, you know, there is none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. And he continues on. Comes to verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. We're sinners who, far from being able to pay off the debt that we have, we only increase it. That's a problem. We're sinners, and the only thing we can do is increase our debt. How would we be able to pay? So we are out. There is no way of escape from God's justice. There is no way back to His embrace if it's left to us. The Scriptures are clear. But our confession asks the second question, which is the next rational question. What about somebody else? What about another creature? Now you can think about it, like for instance, angels. Now angels, the ones who did not fall, the angels in heaven, they are without sin. And they're powerful. You know, perhaps an angel could be convinced to, to somehow make the payment for our sin. They don't have their own debt. Could they pay ours? It's almost this sense of, of desperation, looking around. Is there anybody? And then also, what about an animal? I worked in the Old Testament. What if we could use thousands of animals? Instead of us suffering, they would suffer. They would make payment. We'll get to that in a moment as to why in the Old Testament animals were used, but the ultimate reason is that an animal is not qualified to stand in our place for what we've done. An angel is not able to stand in our place for what we've done. They're not qualified. Ezekiel 18.4, we quoted it earlier, the one who sinned must pay. Human beings sinned. A human being must pay. So that's the first reason. They're not qualified because they are not human beings. The second reason that they cannot pay, make the payment for us, is that no creature could bear the burden of God's wrath. When we read Nahum, Nahum 1, can you imagine any creature who would be able to withstand God in His wrath, who would be able to bear, you know, in our, the, the confession, again, great question, can any mere creature, mere means small or slight, and that's what all creatures are, they stand before the creator of heaven and earth, and they are small and slight, they simply would not be able to bear the burden of God's wrath against sin. couldn't sustain it. They would be consumed before even a fraction of the payment was made. It would be like, you know, you, you totaled my car, a $100,000 car, and said, well, well, you want to wreck my toothpick? Will we be good then? Like, 
There is no, there is no way that that could satisfy. They couldn't bear it. They couldn't sustain it. But you may say, well, then what about the Old Testament when they sacrificed the animals? You know, Hebrews 10.4 addresses, says there, it's impossible that the blood of, of bulls and goats could, could take away sin. They had to be made day after day. And ultimately, the reason God allowed that to happen is they pointed ahead to someone else, the ultimate payment maker. Those sacrifices pointed to Jesus. They pointed to one who would stand in our place, who would be our substitute, who would be able to sustain. So when you think about the required payment maker, the one who can bring us back into God's embrace, we're pushed, we're directed to look at Jesus Christ. And that's really what Lord's Day 5 is doing. Not mentioning Jesus, but you know the answer is Jesus. You read through Lord's Day 5, and you're just being pushed to say, I know the answer is Jesus. And every wrong answer, you say, no, that's not Jesus. No, that's not Jesus. No, that's not Jesus. The answer is Jesus. And it's pushing us to look to Him. Pushing us to look to the One who was able to stand in our place as a human being, and who was strong enough to bear the burden of God's wrath, God's justice against sin. That's who Jesus Christ is. True and righteous man, no debt, never increasing the debt, no debt at all, and no mere creature, more powerful than all creatures. We read Hebrews 2, 14 to 18, speaks about Jesus Christ being a human being sharing in that nature with us in order to save us. He needed to share in our flesh and blood, become one of us so that He might be able to pay, to make atonement for our sins. And God made our Lord Jesus Christ an offering for sin. He took the punishment, the death, and anguish and shame that our sins deserved. He's our substitute. It's as though Jesus pushes us out of the way. It says it's coming. The Lord's justice is coming. Out of the way. I take it. And I can. Because I'm your brother. And because I'm your God. He's, he's a mediator. And, and the question again... It's almost like you could do sermons on this Lord's Day just looking at the questions. What kind of mediator and deliverer must we seek? The question knows we need somebody to stand in the middle. That's what a mediator is. Somebody who stands and, and bridges the gap between two parties. And what you have with Jesus Christ is a mediator who is on the one side a human being representing us and on the other side God the one who requires the payment. He's a perfect mediator and deliverer. He goes between God and man. And interestingly, you've probably heard the word mediator in terms of when there's a strike. You hear on the news there's a strike and the two parties are at different ends and they have a mediator come in. We have to be careful here because that oftentimes means that there's some compromise which neither party actually likes but which they're able to live with. But Jesus Christ is not that kind of mediator. He's not one who comes in and makes compromises for us and for our eternal destination. He makes no compromise on lowering the glory and the honor that's due God. Doesn't make any compromise in terms of God's justice. They all remain as they are. And in this mediator, you have perfect payment made and perfect love for us displayed. A return to God's loving embrace. That's the way back. That's the gospel of the way back. 
Next week, we'll look a little more closely at Jesus Christ and learn more about how we learn of this from Scripture. But may God direct our hearts and our minds to look to Jesus, to know that we're sinners who deserve hell, who deserve eternal punishment, but that God has made a way for payment to be made. And He's given given us a mediator and deliverer who has who can and has delivered us from sin and death and brought us to life. Amen. Let's now respond in song. And once again, we'll sing from one of the alternate alternate psalms, melodies, Psalm 98.